Sortmanship. And uh, first, I'll make a quick announcement that doesn't have anything to do with, with Sortmanship. And uh, just to say that if you haven't gone to the registration room in a while, there we do have two book vendors there. So if you want to maybe just take a quick look around the book exhibits before going out to dinner, you can let be there. It's all So in the paper I gave earlier today, which I'll be putting on YouTube because I taped it with my phone, um, I used some visual devices by several authors that, or se several sources, we can't be sure they're single authors because many of them are anonymous, um, that, and how these accord with late scholastic theories of time and timekeeping. And because you can't really understand these without demonstration in this, what we're going to do is actually enact these and explain how these visual ideas go along with that. So I'm going to kind of gloss over more of the intellectual, but we'll do the actual demonstration. Thank you. I think that again, please. Um, so just as an overview, first I'm going to talk about the philosophy of time measurement in late scholastic philosophy, just as a very, very brief overview. And then we're going to look at some examples in fencing books. Uh, first, we're going to what I left out of there is, is um, the 133 manuscript. We'll be looking at sequences of actions and seeing with God's eye in the Tower Manuscript 133. We're going to look at Aristotelian physics in the Lichtenauer tradition. We're going to look at iconography of sequence in Fiori de Laveri's Flower of Battle. We're going to look at the idea of tempo in Italian rapier fencing and how this accords with early, uh, early scientific ideas of measurement. And then finally, we're going to end with true and false times in George Silver, because uh, my student Bill, who's doing the PowerPoint for me, uh, is a huge aficionado of George Silver, and they, this is a little maybe less scientific, but it does maybe, I think, accord with ideas of truth and falseness in Elizabethan society, which they're somewhat concerned with. There's uh, quite a lot in Shakespeare about falseness and lying that they're concerned. Would you this again? So, background. Um, I saw a wonderful uh, lecture at, at Smith College earlier this year by Ellie Truitt, who wrote that wonderful book on automata in the Middle Ages. And she made a very interesting point that really lit a light bulb in my head, 
which is that the codex is in many ways like a clock, that a clock, as Nicholas Cusa said in the 15th century, contains all times within it. That is, like God, you can see all times at once, or at least go through various periods. So unlike a scroll, and there of course we have a Torah, because if you know anything about Jewish liturgy, we read a Parsha every every week, and we go through it, and then we, uh, we you know, and then at Rosh Hashanah, we start over again. And the Codex, though, well, we can flip back and forth with it. We can go from one place to another. It's a choose your own adventure, as it were. So you can be in different places at different times using the Codex. And Eli Triad pointed out that, well, you know, these automatic clocks, isn't this really the same thing? That the same thing can be enacted over and over in a sort of uh, timelessness, which is a very interesting idea, I think. And so codices themselves are timekeeping devices and ways of measuring time. Let's flip over. Let's see how this lists itself. So this is Eusebian canons. Here, of course, um, this is for the Gospels, but if you know anything about medieval chronicles, very often, following Eusebius, who was the first one to do it with these tables, they're trying to present on the same page. And first person hamburger had that scroll, that, uh, that, that, that chronicle scroll, that presents not just Christian history, but Jewish history, Roman history, Greek history, all these histories together to try to give you an idea of history itself as God might see it. Um, of course, various diagrams for determining time. This is a diagram for computants for determining the, the date of Easter with ephemera tables and various other things. A 12th century manuscript. Darn if I knew how it works. Flip over if you would. And then, of course, Diagrams for mathematical timekeeping, which is when we start getting into this idea of quantification that's so interesting. And this, of course, is a copy um, of the Aldemist with its geometrical diagrams. Of course, this is used for uh, celestial timekeeping with the star. The star is being, of course, the truest clock that many people could know. And according to scholastic philosophy, they mirrored, the stars mirrored the movement of the outermost heavenly sphere, which is the primary movement. All time comes from movement. And of course, nominalist philosophy meant that you had to link movement to uh, move, actual moving things. And of course, you can't actually see the outermost heavenly sphere, but you can see the stars, which are next year in in the cosmology of the medieval world, as it, as it were. If you, uh, most people, of course, did not read the Algamest, they read it in the sphere of Sack and Bosco here, of course, looking at eclipses. But this is the sphere of Sack and Bosco, is sort of uh, a precess. Of, of Ptolemy that was a little more accessible, but still mathematical, geometrical, which is to say geometrical timekeeping. Over. Um, and the same thing with clocks. It's, clocks are, this is a 13th century depiction of a, of a clock, as a key of the water clock from a uh, Uh 13th century, probably the Blanche Castile, but if you flip over, the, you know, a, a water clock or any clock is really a measure of duration, because when we're talking about timekeeping, even talking about, is there a clock on the wall? There should be a clock on the wall. Even if we think about a clock in a modern sense, what it really is is that we're, we're observing durations. We think of time in a sort of Newtonian absolute thing. That these are fixed things. But really, even a clock, and we think especially the wall clock, it's a model of the heavens. And by the movement of the clock, by the change of the clock, then we, that's how we know that time is past. Or we can, you know, we, can, we can read it, but of course, numbers are nothing but conventional symbols. So, and that's really, as you flip over again, and the medieval timekeeping is really nothing but the comparison of relative durations. Um, how, why is this so? Because, well, if we look at medieval philosophy of time, the consideration of what time is, Aristotle, of course, the philosopher preeminent in the Middle Ages. And what Aristotle says about time and the nation of time, time, time is movement. And if, if it's not movement itself, then it's the number of movement, the enumeration of movement as the, applied by the rational thinking human mind to this. The number of motion in respect to the before and after. Keep that in mind. We're going to see that in a little bit when we look at the Lichtenauer school of fencing. If you could flip the slide, please. Well. So how do we know things? How do we count things? Well, here's a passage from John Burdon on his questions on Aristotle's physics. And he says that we can know things, that we can, we can know quantities in Five ways. Four ways, right? Intrinsic, by the thing itself, by counting successively. Extrinsically, by measuring it with something that we know. Uh, proportionately, for instance, we know the area of a cube by measuring the sides. 
and if you flip one more time, by proportional division. And this is really the most important way because this is how medieval people measure time, by comparing one time against another. You can only really only measure one time with another, the relative proportions of known durations. Um, slip over again if you like. So here's just an example of proportional uh, division from a late 15th century German woodcut. Here we can see the scholar, the human scholar, is measuring the pair of dividers a line while holding in his mind, sort of a platonic sense, this bit of this larger truth represented as geometry, because of course geometry is a number in space, being dangled down by this sort of heavenly figure. If you flip again. And dividers, not surprisingly, show up in a lot of fencing books. Specifically, here's from the Bavadi from 1480 from the Porto Bernardino, who says, of that thing over the guy's head, which looks like some, you know, my favorite Martian antenna, um, I am a sextant that can divide, O oh, fencer, heed my reasoning, since you will similarly measure time. Can you flip again? So, and this is not something that's unique to Bavadi. We see this a lot, that uh, Filippo de Bartolomeo Dardi, a fencing master in 15th century uh, Bologna said that he was he was petitioning for a university position, and you know this was his cover letter, and he said that he should have this because geometry matches fencing because in this there's nothing than just measure as I can demonstrate by lecture, and meanwhile he merits a post in astronomy, which is of course number in space and time, because astronomy is by its nature geometrical, as we saw with the alchemists. Um, and not surprisingly, we see a lot of dividers in fencing master's portraits. There we go. Taranto from 1869, we flip over. And here, Degrassi from 1570. A lot of portraits, a lot of dividers lined up in there. Uh, why? Because it's a symbol of measure. So let's move on to actually what this means, right? Enough of the intellectual background. This is what this actually looks like in the flip again. The first thing I want to talk about, and let's grab the sword and bucklers, um, is the first fencing book that we have, translated by Jeffrey Forgang of uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute slash now also an curator at, um, of arms and armor at Worcester Art Museum, formerly of course we worked together at the Higgins, and he translated this. This is 133, and you can see these are very, very iconographical representations. This is not naturalistic depiction, but these are ideas. That you, uh, this book depicts a priest and a student, a woman named Wilpergus, going through these various actions with swords and bucklers. And there's a various, a various uh, sequence. And they each begin and end with the cross. And I don't know if you know anything about Catholic liturgy and medieval liturgy, but sequences of prayers, they begin and end with the cross, that the priest will kiss the book and begin the prayer. So this is, again, they're using a, a vocabulary that they know for something that unfolds in time to mark how things begin. And you can flip over again. Um, and, so just some illustrations from there. They start with various wards and guards that are just being shown, na uh, shown naturalistic, uh, sh shown them ideographically, very ideographic, of course. It's medieval art, and it's a little over And then these sort of go in sequence. So just John Jordan joins diagram. So let's just see what some of this looks like. So let's say Zach starts an award, and Ian also starts an award. Zach cuts it in, Ian is the counter, and then Follows her. Good. But there's several things that can be done. If they can do a similar cut, then do another option. So various things can be done from various guards. So and then of course this is done naturalistically. You guys want to fence likely yeah. a couple, just a couple of little bits. So in actual space and time, here's how this unfolds. Cool. So you get a tip, right? So it's two just couple more. So then when we add, we add actual movement we added thinking to it. How these things operate in space and time. So if we, we and the 133 is not complete. We're missing some folio from it. But if we look at how this works and how this operates in space and time, we can actually diagram the tactical choices that you can make in a battle. And of course, John Jordan has done this. So really, if you think about it, this codex is 
much like Nicola, Nicholas Acuza's case, seeing everything that can unfold in a fencing bout with God's eye. You're seeing the whole thing from outside of time, and then you can understand how one thing works uh, or, or not. And then they're using this, you know, the device of the cross to show you when you start to begin. Let's look at something more theoretical. You guys don't want to grab your long stories. So, in a moment. So, if they flip the next one. Uh, so, it's a and here's the, the slide, of course, saying it's a spot to device to show all possible times. Right? Using this, this, uh, this device from liturgy to show you how things work. Uh, okay. Oh, how do we represent time abstractly? In other words, not just what, but when. Well, that requires some practical demonstration. So that's why I'm going to ask you to get some motions. So, again. So let's talk about the Lucian Arrow School. And this is a very, very interesting work. The first work that we know of this is uh, GNM 3277A, which is in uh, Nuremberg. And uh, it's, it's the first recording of uh, the, the teachings of a uh, master named Johannes Lichtenauer, who may or may not have ever existed, but supposedly carried on the art of fencing from hundreds of years before, because you know, in many traditions, everything comes from the past. And that's a 15th century idea of what they thought he looked like. And it, it uses Aristotelian terminology, if you can flip, up, flip over, to, uh, to explain fencing actions. It also contains a number of other works alchemical, the idea being that by understanding principles and theories and hidden knowledge, you gain power. Uh, it has sections, for instance, of hardened steel. Um, if you can flip over again. So there's explore again. Time is a number of uh, motion from before and after. And here, he says, to all those who belong to the aid of righteous God, a straight and healthy body, choose a well-crafted sword. And then what else do you need to know? Knowledge of the before and after. Aristotelian before and after, strong after, weak and strong, and in that moment. Also, using Aristotelian ter terminology, motus, that beautiful word. So let's see what, uh, what some of this looks like. Can you flip over now? Um, so, and this tradition, by the way, carries on to the 1570s, and even, even after through the 18th century. So let's look at the idea of movement. So, Zach, if you can just, in, in the air, just cut a, cut a sword in half. So, that's a movement. Right? That's a single movement. So that has a beginning, go slowly. It has a beginning and an end. Okay? So let's look at how this might, might work. Let's do uh, this do the technique, uh, do, do this workshop. Just demonstrate the workshop against the end, end of those. That's a technique called this workshop. So that's making a tempo. So if Ian wants to carry that, so Ian, just carry it simply. Go. Ian has to make a smaller time. Ian's time is bigger than Zach's. Zach's sort of connected to his head. So let's do this verse shot, verse shot, uh, let's do this verse shot, verse shot thing. Do it again. Okay, let's do that again. Where you're not actually hitting. What would you do with the pair, by the way? Ready? Go. Okay, now do it where you don't actually make contact with the sword. Because there, you're not making your time smaller than Ian's time. If you make your time smaller than Ian's time, you're not going to. There. So you can see. Zach makes, do that again, Zach makes a time, Ian makes a smaller time, Zach makes a smaller time still. So Zach is being in what we call the Aristotelian before, in the vor. Now, if Ian wanted to take that back, so let's have, let's have Zach do a, a just do a, a first time, Ian, let's have you do a higher time. There, so Ian has made a, sm a smaller and a smaller time, he's acted, take that back, good. And there are various techniques you can use in order to uh, in order to take to take that back. So let's do the let's do the parallel how demonstration from uh, from Meyer's spectacle. So this begins with Ian's going to cut and Zach. Zach's going to carry with that first shot. Then you get the first shot. You doing the you doing the parallel? Sure. Right, right, right. And then where are we going to go flat to the other side? And then okay, do the do the tempo now. So there, you see, he, Zach is bouncing off. He's, he takes back the board. He acts in the in the immediate time to intercept Ian, and then he, he's got this acceleration. Good. So now, let's look. Let's see, were there, was there anything else I wanted to uh, address with that? I don't believe there was. I think that's, so that's it. That's, so that's a good demonstration <coughs> for enough. You want to do a, a couple of quick uh, quick sure. with lunch, sir? I'm going to ask you to move back. 
Uh, let me ask you to move back. And uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna actually grab my sword so that if they get too close to the uh, expensive uh, King State equipment, they I'm gonna pull them away. Right? So do, so do a couple of little, couple, couple of uh, easy passes with the long sword just to see what it looks like in the castle. And we go. Yeah. So that's why you can't act in the That's why you gotta keep the distance here. Um, yeah, good. You okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. I expected him to back up. Yeah, there's no room to I forget around. there's no room to yeah, back up. Yeah, yeah. My so, bad. <laughs> control, Ian. Control. Really One more. Okay, so Zach took the arm and then. Uh, yeah, that was all right, all right, all right, so let's take a little break, and let's move on to the, the next example, which is going to do with some monster stuff. Yeah. Uh, you did, right? The initial attack, you did. We just did that. All right, moving on. Cool, so let's go, uh, I'm going to use Ian for this, for doing some, uh, some jewelry stuff. Um, let's talk about Fury to the for a moment, and I very much like keeping my head, so I'm going to keep uh, so Fury de Liberi was a fencing master in uh, mid to late 14th century and into 15th century Italy. Produced uh, flower battles circa, uh, well, 1410, right? 1409 by his calendar, in February. Um, and he comes down to us in four manuscripts. Uh, one of the Getty, one of the Morgan Library, one that's privately held, and one that's posthumous that I found in Paris in 2008. Yeah. That's the getting. And he uses a number of really, really interesting visual devices for that I don't have time to get into in order to depict the qualities you need to have in fencing. In fact, the body, the body image I showed you before is deprived of this. So the, uh, no, no, go back, go back. The, the elephants is for your stance. Notice that the links for eyesight has a pair of dividers. Uh, there's a number of interesting things there. And then if you flip over, that these guys are holding things like various icons to show you the order of things that you need to do in order to uh, not die when someone attacks you with a dagger. He says, first take your dagger away, then break their arms, and then put them in a, a lock. He uses, you know, he has a key to show that you're putting them in a joint lock, and then cast them, cast them down. So there's, this is the fourth thing. You notice that they're getting progressively older and their ropes are getting more ornate as they do that. This is a very good idea because Ian attacks me. Ian attacks me with a dagger and I want to throw him to the ground. Oh, I forgot to take the dagger away, but then I'm dead. So this is a bad <laughs> Stop him, right? Oh, that's the first thing I do. Break his arm. That's good, right? Put him in the joint line. Good. And then I can lay him down. So first control the dagger, then control the man. How does he show you how to do this? If he uses some other iconography. This is really interesting. So he uses this really interesting iconography to show you the sequence of actions you should follow. So first, you've got the mask, the guy in the gold crown. He shows you the first initial starting position, for instance, in this wrestling thing. And then he shows you uh, a number of scholars with the guild garters that show you what you can do from that position. So there's a number of those scholars following him. And then sometimes there's a countermaster who's got a crown and a garter to foil with the scholar does, that's the counter technique. So it's this very, so much like Warren 33, he's showing sequences of action in sort of a choose your own adventure kind of way in order to show you things that unfold in time. He doesn't have a, uh, much on the theorization of time about when to do it, but he's showing you what to do. He just, you know, the, when to do it comes from practice. So let's see what this looks like practically. So, so in this first one, so I attack Ian with the dagger, Ian stops me. Good job. And then what's Ian do from here? He puts this joint lock on. Good job, Ian. This looks like that to me. So then next, oh, that's what I can do. So then he says, if you do that, redouble it. So what this looks like in time, just get on, take it back, double, double, your, double yourself, double your fun, and do that. Doesn't show you the timing, cool. It doesn't show you the time to do it, but it shows you the sequence of action as you flip ahead. Fury does contain, we got that, we did that, 
There you go. There are, in two places in Fourier's manuscript, though, the word tempo, this idea of tempo. And tempo is a very important word in fencing because we still use this word today. We still use this idea of fencing time today. Again, one tempo in fencing is one movement of the weapon. This is a tempo. This is a tempo. That's a tempo. It's just a faster tempo. It's a smaller time. So, this is something that you can measure and that can be proportionately divided. So, we get um, So, there you are. Simply the duration of one action relatively considered. And thus, we have this idea of contra tempo of time against the time and half time. Philippe Levati explicitly uses this idea of tempo, such as mezzo tempo. Let's just do a, let me just show you what a mezzo tempo would be. Ian, you can describe it a little bit for a second. So, slowly. So, Ian cuts at me with the long sword. Let's go the other direction because they can. So, if Ian cuts at me with the long sword, let's do it slowly. That's all right. There, so what I do, I make a faster time. So, my time is half of his time. I was able to counterattack and get out. That's a mezzo tempo, actually. Good. Flip so ahead. As Vadi says, geometry divides and separates with infinite numbers and measures. The sword is under its purview, since it's useful to measure blows and steps to make the science more secure. Fencing is born from geometry. So, and of course, he relates it also to music, which of course music, I think one of the other four liberal arts, like astronomy and geometry, is number of time. If you can flip ahead, we're going to do great group seconds. So uh, we did the mezzo tempo demonstration, right? Half time. A half, just as a half note is shorter than a whole note, and so a half time is a blow that's shorter and can interrupt a full time blow. This is not at all different from the German concepts of war and not. It's just a different way of expressing it with a different philosophy of time. Uh, it's, instead of looking at the before and after, they're looking at the number part, which you can then divide proportionally by. That make sense? So, flip again. Um, it also echoes, for instance, Nicholas Acusa, 1450, talking about timing the pulses of young men and sick, uh, healthy young men and sick old men, and using clepsydra to gather water for that amount of time, and then weighing that and quantifying it, and thereby being able to quantify something that happens in time, in a time before, you know, a few hundred years before stopwatches were invented in the 18th century, so that the British could time their thoroughbreds. Uh, Galileo, of course, did much the same thing around 1600, which is how he did his experiment with the inclined balls. He, you know, did drop those cannonballs off the Tower of Pisa as, uh, as a bit of a public demonstration, but he did most of his experimentation in, as he tells us, with rolling inclined balls and down planes and Sorry, rolling balls down inclined planes and timing it with the clepsydra and then weighing the results. So, the real turning point in the literature, and really the beginning of what we might begin to think of the rapier, that is the sort of the Renaissance shellman from which actually modern foil and epe and even saber, I would say, are indirectly descended, is Camillo Agrippa of 1553, who if you're interested in Camillo Agrippa, I have written quite a lot on him, and I would recommend that you pick up my writings. I do not have time to say everything there is to say about Camillo Agrippa here. Instead, I'd rather look at some of the devices he uses in his treatise. Um, and his idea is proportionalizing and ra rationalizing, and that's a very well put hyphen there, ra ratioizing movement and time. Um, if you could flip on. So just give you some examples, right? Uh, he's from Milan. We don't know exactly where he was born. He died in 1600. Uh, e. Brown found his, his uh, death records in Rome. And he was associated with Farnese and Medici circles in Renaissance Rome. So over, if you will. So he's very interested in rationalizing fencing instead of various mnemonic postures like ox and plow and iron gate and things like that. He says, no, there's four basic postures of fencing. I call them one through four. One, two, three, four. Simple, right? Simplifying it. We flip on. He also gives these geometrical proofs. This is the proof of the lunge that, hey, I can reach further. The more I bend my knee, the more further I can reach. Actually, it's a really nice. So I just, that just hurts my knee. So the more I extend my arm, the more I raise, the more I raise and bend, my arm and bend my knee, the further I can reach. 
So that's what he's saying there. This idea of quantity and geometry as being the root of fencing in space, but not just that, but also fencing in time. Which is um, and the same idea of the idea of humanity. There's your there's your dividers again. But he's saying that human beings are naturally like dividers. Just as you can use a stick from a tree and draw all sorts of geometrical figures, and fencing is ultimately born from geometry, so too can human beings naturally perform the things needed to do in fencing. Look over. Um, he tries to depict actions in time. So this isn't four people fencing. This is two people fencing at two different moments in time. So in this, flip over now, he started participating in Moybridge's um, animal motion studies. So this whole idea that you that uh, we you know of trying to depict now with God's eye, see with God's eye, what's happening over time. But of course, he also uses a sophisticated vocabulary of movement as well. Um, oh, and this is just showing the idea, by the way, here's also many great pointers when we give lectures. But you can see the idea of time over all things. Here in this, this, um, this I, deeply iconographic uh, portrait, he's arguing against the old school philosophers, and you know, he's fashionably dressed, and he's got his sword, and it's put on the globe, and there's his geometrical diagram, and he's got an armillary sphere, and of course, dividers. And he's arguing there against the philosophers. The time is over all things. So, the over here. So, just to demonstrate some concepts in Rager and how these work, how the same concepts really work with you know no different a weapon. So, Ian's going to come. Ian's got a sword. He comes in the distance. He finds my blade. I don't like this, so I'm going to try and find his blade again on the other side. And any movement I make, he's going to go around and hit me. Okay, let's do that in tempo. Yes. Well, he works. Great. Let's take a step back. He comes into distance, he finds the blade in tempo, and I am struck. So he's making a tempo, right? I make a tempo, he makes a smaller tempo, and I'm struck. If I don't like this happening, remember to now nah, try to hit me. That wasn't actually. Thank you. So you see, I did the time against his time. He tries to hit me. Those words. against his time. Um, idea of mezzo tempo, that's there too. So that was one time against another. Time one duration against time in the same duration. What if he tries to make too big a time? Like what if he tried to cut me like a stupid person? I can make a mezzo tempo action. I can do all sorts of mezzo, mezzo tempo actions. No problem. So we still say if making a, something in tempo, right? To do something in tempo, do something in time. In the time of my action, he makes a hit in tempo. And we still, we would say that these would be, you know, those two actions in contra tempo and mezzo tempo, those would simply be forms of counter to what we would say. And tap me against the attack. Uh, flip over. Now, and for this, we're going to have to ask Zach, um, Zach to uh, take over flipping, so I'm going to be built for this. So the last author whom I want to consider now is George Silver, who wrote in 1599, during the reign of Good Queen Bess, who was an immense English nationalist, <clears throat> despised those Italians with their great hearts, believed in good English steel, good English old methods, rooted his nationalism in the past, would have no doubt brought, fought for, uh, voted for Brexit. Silver, Silver was definitely a Brexit guy. And Bill is our, our, uh, our George Silver. So, this is, so he talks about what he calls true times and false times. And I kind of relate this, because the false times are not really the times you really want to move in. Or if you are, then you're doing it because you're using the false or fake to fake somebody out, perhaps. But he says, basically, you, you need to move in your true times. If you don't move in your true times, bad things are going to happen to you. Um, so this falseness, of course, is something bad. I mean, this goes back to Italian honor codes where duels were born out of someone giving the lie. If you've heard of giving the lie, this was in Codes of Honor and Lucio, et cetera. This is what, what birthed, um, what birthed uh, duels. So, a uh, little, little quote there from Romeo and Joe, that you lie, draw if you be men. Um, and of course, they, there are swords and bucklers because they're serving men, as those we in England. Um, but yeah, there was, there was a lot of questions in, in the, the literature of Elizabeth England 
of truth and falseness and deceit and dissimilitude and distrust of courtiers and other foreign things. That what was English is true and natural and good, and that which is false is Spanish or Italian, but generally strange. It's from South of, it's from over Calais, and we generally don't like that because we are British and we're leaving the European Union down. Uh, if you flip over. So, quote Silver, there are eight times, where a for a true and for a false. Flipping over. Let's look at what these are. True times, the time of the hand, the time of the hand and body, the time of the hand, body, and foot, and the time of the hand, body, and feet. So, what's he saying? Leave the sword. He's talking about the, the kinetic chain. If you leave the sword, then you're, you're, you know, then you're making yourself a bit safe, but as we're about to demonstrate why leading of the sword is a good idea. Flip over. False times. The time of the foot. Bad idea. The time of the foot and body. Bad idea. Time of the feet, body, and hand. Bad idea. I just stepped into danger and I got hit. Let's see what this looks like in real, in, in life. So, if I, let's, uh, let's fill it out, we're going to stand too close. And we're just going to be in the time of the hand. So, if we're in the time of the hand, we're in bad shape, because we can't, I can't react in time. I can't react, keep doing that, keep hitting me in the head. I can't react in time, I can't react in time, I can't react in time. I can't react in time, I'm just going to hit the head. I'm going to stop that before I get CD. But, yeah, if Bill uses a false time. Let's say he steps in and then he packs. So he steps in ahead of his guy. I hit the kind of, and then, while well, I'm safe, and he, even if he wants to hit me, plenty of time to carry. Let's do that a little more in, in tempo. Uh -huh. So, step. There you go. That's easy. But, if Bill is at the proper distance and he leads with his hand, then he can hit me. I'm late, and then he gets back and escapes. Right? Let's do that again. So leave the sword in time. And he gets back and he escapes. Of course, I can if I see him coming, I can carry, right? And then it builds a trouble in time of the hand, right? Get back. So he can make a feint, but of course to make the feint well, he's got to lead with his sword. So he leads, he goes. So is that good? Not so good. Move the foot first, huh? <laughs> Put your hand up before you ever reach him. Lead with the sword. There. So he draws me and then I go. Do that again. Nope. There. He led properly. You see, he led properly and I couldn't do anything. Good. That's it. So that demonstrates how these expressions give life, rise to physical truth. Okay. Just over. So, just to sum up this, this quick, quick and dirty little demo. Um, to sum up, timekeeping in pre modern. Europe was not about stopwatches and absolute time. It was relative, not absolute. Benzene books very much participated in this early modern scientific debate of how do we measure time. And we can see fencing books at following the Zissel thesis, if I spelled it correctly, uh, typo, as this productive collaboration between craft masters and academics that also, it's, it's a form of Aristotelian populism that's the spread of philosophy into the vernacular. And it's a technology, and what I'd like to do, I think I've got one more slide, maybe? Yeah. So, what I'd rather like to go with this, with my own work, is relating this idea to, um, I'd, like, I'd like to make, you know, I'm open suggestions, I'd like to make a work uh, write a monograph that makes this useful to historians and an answers of interesting historical, historiographical questions and looks at fencing books as more than just curiosities or records of violence, but as something that participate in questions about how to quantify and how to represent the physical world on the page in a static meeting, which is a question that's of no small importance to the growth of modern science and the scientific revolution. And if anyone has any ideas for hooks that I can use for that, that sort of idea, I am more than welcome, uh, I would more than welcome hearing it. So uh, I think that's it. Cool. All right, good job. So I think we've got some time.
time for, oh yeah, we've got a good 15 minutes for questions and answers. Yes. I have, I have two questions. The first is a sort of much more general one, which is what got all of you into this. Um, swords are fun. Swords are fun. Don't don't point to me. Why historical fence? I mean, uh, why really historical? Fun. Well, you know, we all do modern fencing too. Zach fences is that day. Uh, I mean, I think <coughs> first love, but you know, yeah, uh, Ian's a fence saver in college. And, uh, I fence saver in college and uh, actually came into swords. Through uh, theatrical fencing, mm -hmm. and we so you know we all have modern fencing experience. It's just this is kind of a little more fun, romantic. Why did anybody do anything medieval? Why did people join the SCA? Why did people go and hang out at the cloisters? Mm -hmm. You know, why do people do? Well, that's what the, I, the question I want to know. So <laughs> why do people do that? Uh, I mean, it's it, it's modern romanticism. But the thing is, is that what we do is called the historical European. It's, it's historical European martial arts movement. Mm -hmm. Usually, it's called that. and then Western martial arts stuff. You know, man. But we, um, you know, we, we're not reenacting or dressing up. Um, you know, we're Ken, Zach, and Ian, Bill, and Mike, and because Mike was also was taking photos. But we, um, but we're not, um, but we're not, you know, we, uh, we, you know, we're not reenacting or dressing up. The idea is to kind of rediscover the skill. But of course, in order to do that, you can't really do it by kind of cargo cult means. You have to have a deep understanding of the idiom they're trying to express things in, which is. Kind of what led me down this path, and really, it's when I discovered that these things existed. That's kind of why I became a medieval historian as an undergraduate. It's like you know, it's like, you know, it's almost like I got hooked on heroin. You know, who knows why? And I've ruined my life just to say, probably would be in, be in a better place financially if I just had a smack habit. Then I decided to become a PhD slash fencing master. So uh, you undergrads just say no to grad school, um, but go do something lucrative instead. But the. Uh, but you know, why does anybody why does anybody uh, do any of this? You know, I don't know, why are you guys doing swords of fun? Uh, <clears throat> honestly I wish I could have better answer than that. Yeah, but, uh, white male liberal rage. White male liberal <laughs> rage. <laughs> white male you know, and it, that that kind of does bring in the fact that some people do see it and there is there is um, shall we say a disturbing uh, ethnocentrism to some parts of the movement, which I spent a lot of time speaking against and losing a uh, no small number of frenemies because of it. Um, but uh, it's that that is, I think, uh, certainly something that, that cannot be discounted. But it's the same, I think, for any use of the past. You know, any use of the past. You can know, point, you know, point to the Catholic Church, it's the same thing. Uh, other questions? Uh, just a comment on what you just said. I just saw a video yesterday of a group of Japanese teenagers and young adults working on Lichtenau. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <coughs> a martial arts welcomes rest of Westerners. <coughs> Easterners are also beginning to engage in these arts. And, you know, in the same way just as Westerners have been, you know, entranced with katana for, you know, for however long in, in Asian martial arts. So why not? You know? <coughs> other, other questions? Sorry. The sword is not the, the only weapon to be used in hand-to-hand -hand combat. No, it's the, there's the axe and there's the spear and so forth. Is there any I mean, I've never oh, yeah. heard of anything similar being done with battle axes or spears. Oh, we do that. Oh, yes. There's, there's oh, the, oh, there's yes. The, there's we, the, there's the, oh, yeah, we play with those. Yes, yeah, so, we, we played this, but the, the, the sword always kind of had pride of place, and especially, especially as a fencing uh -huh. weapon. Um, that you know, they, you, to, to play with pole axes, you need armor. Armor's expensive. Ian just finally got his. Maybe we'll do some more. <coughs> but but I just finally got my tracking number. I didn't get. You just finally get your tracking number. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it takes you know. So we do that. Yeah, I, I play with some spear and a joust. You know, kind of prove myself. My, my question really was, is there a culture surrounding the battle axe or the spear that is parallel to Oh, the yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the pole, let's not say battle axe, let's say the, the pole axe. There was, in, you know, in the, the vision of Tondal, you know, Tondal is a knight in the 50s, this is a 15th century Burgundian thing, and he schleps around the pole axe with him all the time. This is how you know he's worldly because he's in love with his pole axe. That, there, that, yeah, in the 15th, in, uh, in, in, in According to the Dukes of Burgundy, there was apparently a, a fetish for pole axes, and actually, um, 
uh, except for Spokno, he lives in New York. And he actually, he, he makes pole axes. There's this whole like, Burgundian pole axe thing. I don't, I don't pretend to understand it, the Burgundians and their pole axes, but you know, they love those things. And you know, daggers, daggers are a thing too, right? Yeah. Well, everybody had one. Yeah, and quarterstaffs are a thing. We love quarterstaffs. Oh yeah, the English especially. I mean, the biggest section, aside from the back store that Silver has, is on quarterstaff, the quintessential English weapon. In fact, he teaches longsword from quarterstaff. But of course, that's all, you know, you know, sticks are everywhere, right? The French have their own stick tradition, so. All right, uh, other questions? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for calling out contingent of historical fencing that's misappropriated for quite Eurocentric philosophies. I agree with that. Um, my question is, uh, do you see any relationship between these fencing treatises and uh, medieval and early modern records of dance? Um, this kind of uh, a crossover in terminology also ideas of tempos and things. There are people who do work on that. Um, I am not a dancer. Um, I don't <laughs> I don't dance. You're very graceful. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, well, to, to, to parry the bamba, you need a couple of the grass. Yeah, it's um, but, so but it is, it is, it is very much, you know, never give a sword to a man who plays dance. But um, there are, there's, a, there's quite a bit of overlap in terminology and also ideas of tempo and things like that. And also, it's also, even more importantly, it's all part of the, the culture of courtliness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm reminded of that famous bit in, in the courtier where uh, a gentleman is a ball and lady. Asked him to do dance, he says, No, I don't dance. Well, you can converse, we join. He says, No, I, what, what is your business then, sir? I, I fight. Well, then, someone should oil you and put you away in a cabinet, lest you grow rusty or disused in times of peace. So, but there's the idea that, yes, a gentleman ought to dance, and a gentleman should, should dance. Um, and also, a lot of the movements, uh, people see a lot of movements, especially things like Spanish right here, fencing, and also there are various sorts of, sorts of, of dances. Um, and actually, Sidney so Angla, who is um, really sort of like the dean of these, these studies. Uh, his wife is Margaret McGowan, who's a very good dance historian. So that's a, and actually, I hope that in terms of us as a field that in time human studies will come to be as recognized as dance <coughs> studies. So whether there will be a chair of that, we have to find out. So uh, fencing relies on hiding your movement, whereas dancing relies on communicating your movement. Yeah, this is important. So they are somewhat conflicting skills. Yeah. It's, it's true as well, yeah. Uh, sir? Actually, my question is very similar to that as well. But in the dance manuals, on the law of in the case of RFP, they say just do this, do this, do this, and do that. So I'm just wondering why the fencing manuals don't get involved so much in the philosophical thing that you were speaking about. They're just practical how to manuals without explaining any of this. The thing is, is that unlike a dance, as Ian kind of pointed out, right? You're, you're, it's, it's not just do this and do that. It's that it's, you do this, but if he does this, you do this other thing, and like maybe you should do this other thing in the first place and do this. It's a lot looser because you're trying to deceive the other person, not work with them. So it's not as simple like the diagram of 133. It, it starts getting very complex very, uh, very, very quickly, and there's also things like hiding, hiding your movement, things like that. So the theorization is very important because that's an abstraction of skills that you need to, to do that. And of course, it's something that you're, that, that you learn through experience. But lessons, to give a lesson. You remember how it was sort of working with Ian and I gave him a cue when he did something? This is how it was taught historically. Um, this is how it's still taught, the individual lesson. And this is somewhat like a partner dance, where the master provokes the reaction from the student. And this is how you, you gain body knowledge of it. This is still how I teach. Um, when I give a lesson, it's, it's, it's an embodied knowledge. So the passing it on is something like a dance, but the actual execution of it is nothing. Um, this was wonderful. Uh, I was just wondering about the importance of the sound uh, in fencing. Um, you know, maybe using it, uh, uh, using it um, for measuring uh, the distance from your opponent, um, or it does rely purely on uh, on sight. You know, uh, I mean, I have this idea of this romantic. Um, Training uh, in fencing when you are doing it blindfolded, or is this just like a movie trick? <laughs> so how does that work? So how does that work? Here you come. Or actually, uh, 
Yeah, we'll yeah, 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 It's like not slightly. It's a sentiment of your devotion. 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 That is, is important. These sources talk about that a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't get into that because that kind of got away from the time, the, the time aspect that I was concentrating on. But he, but uh, Lichtenauer says, suppose weak is strong, weak is strong, and strong is weak. If he's strong, yield to it. If he's weak, go for it. And that's all further. That's all. this more in modern fencing, I don't think it comes up in a, in a treatise, but if I wanted to prompt a response from Ken, he's jumpy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, there's not the sound like a, the, how there is, no, there's no, <laughs> the that sounds like a fencing strip, it's supposed to be a lot louder, but, yeah, yeah. Issue no, the appell, the appell is a, is a very important thing, um, it's in a lot, I mean, they have those big fencing slippers, too, yes. no, the appell is very far possible, everything, yeah, it's yes. more small sort though, really, yeah, so it's a little later period than in the piece. Yeah. So, any other questions? One more, which is that I've been hear, sort of hearing things that people talking about sword making, about something they call edge geometry. Is there any connection in that geometry and the geometry of the movements you're talking about? Mm, let's talk about geometry. So you need to look at the work of Peter um, Johnson, who has wonderful work on sacred geometry as in cathedral proportions and cathedral geometry and the construction of swords and how swords can be kind of reduced to geometrical formulae, uh, Peter Johnson. Um, and that, that's in the geometry, and geometry, it just requires, it's just the angle of the edge uh, when you've got a knife or a sword. I mean, I don't really bother with sharp objects that much. It's not my business, I don't actually try to I'm not trying to slice each other. No, but you know, they're in the kitchen. Okay, so they're in the kitchen. Yeah, you also tend to run out of students, and it makes it hard to make the legs. Though there are people in HEMA who do practice with sharps and do cutting contests against inanimate objects. Oh, yeah. Right? And there are. And formally on inanimate objects. I'm just so interested in that term, edge geometry. It's just the angle. I get that it's trying. Well, it's just the angle of the edge, and you can have like. It can be beveled, and it can be like this, and all that. And they have various sorts of edge geometries for various things. So you can have various edge geometries for different things. So, for instance, you might have a very thin knife, very thin for like a blade knife, and then you may have something that's a little more robust. It's going to be a little more wedge shaped for uh, for a long sword. So that's it's just it's just refers to sort of the cross section of the edge. That actually uh, brings up another point about sound. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah. 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 like if you uh, edge alignment is part of the thing because it has to actually cut someone, not that, but if they were sharp, and uh, if you if you swing properly, it'll make a whistly sound. But if you just even a little bit off, it doesn't make any noise at all. The push. So it is a important. Aspect of uh, and, uh, something interesting is the treatises swiftly say to listen for that. Yeah, it's one of the few things we actually have documented yeah. on how do you know you're cutting well, um, and it's listening for the whistle. Yeah, it's reminding me of Cool, huh? So, uh, cool. That being said, I hope you'll enjoy this. We'll ramble with yeah. swords for the next four hours. Yes, we've been talking about swords a lot. <laughs>